Good morning. Unfortunately, Charlie's a bit under the weather, so we will be singing the opening hymn as a worship band today. So please stand and we'll sing Come Thou Fount. call to worship this morning is from Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor, Splendor and majesty, majesty before him, strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Let's worship.
May the Lord be with you. Please pass the peace among each other. Children are dismissed at this time. Please fall Pastor Sarah. Good morning, church. It's wonderful to see you all. My name is Jen Calverly. I am manager of operations here at TCC, and a warm welcome to our visitors. First time, second time, third time. If you have not filled out a Connect card, please do. We want to hear from you. We want to connect with you. There's Connect cards in the pew backs in front of you, but there's also a QR code if you want to scan that and fill it out online. And then we have our offering boxes if you want to put physical cards in our offering boxes, which are at the exits here. Um, there's also a QR code on the back of your bulletin for offerings, so if you want to do it electronically. All right, so the send is coming up. And I, there's, everyone's like, what is the send? What is it? Well, it's, this is a, a big event. It's at BU Aganis Arena. And it's for young adults and students for spreading the gospel throughout the world. And we're blessed to have the Send here in Boston this year, which is just a revival waiting to happen. So very exciting. Um, Jared is gonna, gonna give us a really good missions moment next week on the Send and really give us more information. But please sign up. The registration is in your newsletter. And our woman to woman event coming up at For Julian Farm, Monday evening, August 28th at 6.15. Women are invited to pick flowers in the flower garden. If you have never done this, you are going to love it. I've done it multiple times. Um, so please register. The last day to register is August 25th. So please read your newsletters. We're going to have, in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a lot of stuff coming out about our fall kickoff. So please keep reading your newsletter and register there. All right. Prayer time. morning, church. Let us come to a time of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the power of your Holy Spirit. We worship and praise you, lifting your name above any other name. We marvel at the earth you created, the air that we breathe, the lilies of the fields, the beauty of sunrises and sunsets. How amazing is your power and creativity, the delicate, perfect balance and detail of it all. We praise you that you cover and embrace this fallen world, working in our midst for your grace that flows endlessly to us each day. We celebrate your love. We worship you because we can breathe in the resurrection life the glimpses of the new heaven and the new earth, the eternity with you, enjoying your heavenly abundance. We praise you that we become fully redeemed and restored when we give our life to you. But even so, we lament that every day we reject these gifts from you. Merciful Lord, we acknowledge and confess that we sin against you in thought, in word, and in deeds. We have not loved you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Deepen within us our sorrow for the wrongs that we have done and the good we have left undone, compromising your word and your will for us. You are gracious and compassionate. There is always forgiveness in you. And so now we confess to you all of our sins. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. Salvation comes from you alone. Bind up that which is broken. Give us your light in the darkness of our sins. Give us your strength in the face of sin to flee from it. 
deliver us from our evil habits and interest in our former sins. Let us delight in you. We thank you for your forgiveness by grace through faith. We now bring before you our concerns and our needs, our petitions, and lay them at the foot of your cross. We pray that you bless those who mourn, heal their brokenness, be present to those who are brokenhearted and their spirit feels crushed. May they sense your unfailing love and cling to hope in you, our anchor. Immerse them in your love and lead them through the dark periods. We lift up those facing illness. Give them the hope and courage amidst any fear of pain and death, today and every day. Comfort their pain and give them healing, O oh Jesus. Fill them with your peace and strength. We pray for the victims of the fires in Maui and Hawaii. We pray for their families and friends, searching for unaccounted loved ones. Lord, have mercy. Give them the comfort and the assurance and hope that can only come from you in the face of this terrible disaster. Give rest to these people and to the land. Give relief to all victims of wars ranging, violence, trafficking, all because of the scourge of greed. Our needs are many, but you already know all of them. Lord, lead us to seek your kingdom and your righteousness, and we know that you will give us what we need because you are our good, good Father. Give us your heart, your eyes, your words, your love, so that we can make the most of every opportunity to share the good news to all around us. Teach us to carve out time to be hospitable in an evangelistic way to those that we talk to who have not accepted you as Savior. And thank you for your, the deep and true feeling that we have in our hearts that no matter what happens around us, you are on your throne. You rule over the heavens and the earth. Your word remains forever. And your perfect plans, they will be done. All glory belongs to you in the highest. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading today is from Revelation 7, 9 through 17. After this, I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know. And he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning. I'd like to add another reading from... The Old Testament. Second Kings six verses fifteen through seventeen. 
When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And he said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, a mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha, the word of the Lord. Father, would you breathe upon us today through your word, by your spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. So we're doing prayers this summer, not long prayers. Jesus has something to say about long-winded prayers. And quick, short, snapshot prayers. The first one was, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, out of Revelation 4. Chapter 5 was simple, amen. So here's your prayer, your prayer assignment, amen, right? That's nice. But you're agreeing to what God has done, holding the plan of your life, holding the entire plan of redemption before him. So we amen that, we agree with it. And then last time, two weeks ago, I know this seems like a long time. How long, O Lord? How long? That's another quick, short prayer. How long is this going to go on? Destruction, death, injustices, the whole evil of this present evil age that if you see the reels of Lahaina, you got a really strong sense of how evil this world can be. And today, the prayer is out of Revelation 7, open my eyes, Lord. I always uh, have often said this from the front. I'd like to be exiled on the Greek isle that was John on the island of Patmos. And his eyes were wide open a long time ago. But he could see. It says it so many times in the book of Revelation. And then I saw. And I wonder how blind we actually are to this vision of chapter 7. This vision is answering the question, the blindness that we might carry that asks this question, can anyone be saved? Can, can, can God be at work? Can, can God save my husband? <laughs> I'm sure somebody in my household is asking that question. Can God save my co-worker? Can God save me? Can God do, is God doing anything? And this vision of Revelation 7 settles the matter because it is in loud script the promise that God keeps his promises. Because this vision that begins with this a great multitude that cannot be counted is a direct link to a promise that was made to Abraham a long time before that, pulling him out of his tent in the beautiful Middle Eastern sky. These are your descendants, if you're able to count them, all the stars. And now fast forward the end from the beginning, right? This is the vision of the end game, from every nation, from every culture, from every tribe, from every bloodline, from every peoples, that's the generic, everyone, from out of everyone, and then out of every language. This is the vision. I would submit, a good friend of mine used to say that, our vision of God is entirely entirely too small, way too small. And so open our eyes, Lord, to see what you're doing. And can anyone be saved? And so you have this great multitude that no one can count. And they say one thing, absolutely, salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation belongs to him. I don't know if you've seen this movie on Netflix, Jesus Revolution, 
Uh, no endorsement of Netflix, by the way, but Jesus Revolution is on Netflix. And it's about this place called the Pirate's Cove in Newport Beach, California. I don't know if you've ever been to Newport Beach, California. Have anybody been to Newport Beach? Some of you. And Balboa Island is this really great restaurant there. And uh, let's just say it's a very, very affluent area of the world, right? And yet, by God's divine appointment, a long time ago now, the hippies come to Christ, and they all get baptized. There's even a part in the movie that talks, and that's the true part. We've got these kids driving from Texas, and they want to get baptized at Pirate's Cove. And lo and behold, even this summer, people are regathering at Pirate's Cove to get baptized. Go back a little bit, 1812, February in Salem, Mass. Not the warmest temperature. And they're watching five young men going to the, mid to the mission field. Adoniram Judson is one of them. He's kind of like a patron saint in New England because Gordon Conwell, Gordon College, all named after A.J. Uh, Gordon, Adoniram Judson. And they go. But you know how many people are there watching them in the bitter cold? 1,500 people. There were even seminary students who walked from Andover Seminary, Andover Mass, right, all the way to Salem. Incredible, right? And then 50 years ago, I was told right before this service, um, Tom Phillips, who Tom and Gert Phillips had, were longtime members here, this, this is the anniversary of Chuck Colson uh, conversion to Christ 50 years ago. Well, what about today? Well, I heard last week a man from Sudbury had $11 in cash. Does anybody carry cash anymore? I guess I don't. But he had 11 bucks in cash. So he went into the thrift store just to kind of burn through this cash. And he picked up a King James Bible. Have you ever read the King James Bible? I don't understand half of it. So he picked up this King James Bible, and he doesn't even get through to the New Testament, and he's converted. This is today. Can God save? Are we blind to that? Can God save you? You may think, Tom, you have no idea my background. I have another picture, Abbey Road. We're going down memory lane a little bit here. Penny Lane, you want to call it? Abbey Road, please, not that one. Yeah, you know that. <laughs> the Beatles, right? There's an anniversary about this. And if you huh, look further down, I don't think I can share that story. Maybe I won't, but okay. If you look further down, there's Abbey, Bap Abbey Road Baptist Church. And there was a school there, and there was this desperate Euro-Swiss lost teenager who was tired of his lifestyle, and he gave his heart to Jesus right there on that beer road. You know, people criticize the foxhole Christians. I don't. I don't. You know what a fox foxhole Christian is? It's these people who are backed into a corner, and all they can do is turn, out to, turn to God and say, help, save me. The, defini the biblical definition of salvation is precisely that. You've got the Israelites. They've got 600 chariots coming at them. It's like the in extremis, right? Can you please save us a little earlier before these chariots come to us? So many times in the Bible, you've got Saul of Tars. The, 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 the list is endless. And maybe you've not reached this point in your own life of absolute utter desperation. You know, my friend Pete James has this phrase, Lord, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. <laughs> I'm not praying that prayer, but... So can God, be, can God save today? 
Are we, are we blind to that, to that? Are we blind? Are we seeing today? The other blindness here comes when this great multitude, John asks the question in verse 14, says, so who are these people? Well, he's being asked, to, I don't know, you tell me who they are. And they're the ones coming out of the great tribulation. Now I know everybody's got their theories about the great trib. We're not talking about that. What I'm talking about here is that they are coming out of it, right? They have, they have gone through that death ordeal. It's an ongoing process that the numbers are being gathered even as we speak. And the blindness, the second blindness that I want to talk about, where we're asking ourselves, are my eyes really open here, is how do I construct my life? Is my life built on Avoiding strategies, avoiding strategies to avoid sufferings and pains and persecutions? Or am I walking through my life preparing myself for the inevitable? There's a story of George Matheson, Scottish guy, in the, in the 1800s. He's a student at Glasgow University, and... I don't know, but I think he's preparing for the ministry. At least that's where he ends up. And he gets a diagnostic a diagnosis from his doctor that he has an irreversible degenerative eye condition. But he's also engaged. So George shared the sobering news with his fiancée. She returned his engagement ring with a note. And it said this, I cannot see my way clear. I cannot see my way clear to go through life bound by the chains of marriage to a blind man. Lord, open. And you know, it, he ended up being completely blind. But you just wonder who was really the blind one here and who was the one who could see through. So the blindness here is this desire or sense of wanting to avoid the inevitable of suffering and pain that this world brings. The next one, I have a video for it. And this was played at our TCC camp by Aaron. Um, <laughs> so let's, let's run this video. It goes fast, so you gotta pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> <laughs> We're blind to the guidance of the Good Shepherd. Because if you capture the last part of that magnificent vision of where this is all going, the plan of redemption with an innumerable company from all over the world, worshiping gods, the last part is a hymn to the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd that has guided these people through the great trials and tribulations of this life into eternity. And he protects them. He guides them. He provides for them. If you look at what it says, it says that they, the, the thirsty will not thirst anymore. The hungry will not hunger anymore. In, in a culture addicted to feeling good, in a culture wanting satisfaction and stimulation, a, a, a stimulation satisfaction that will never, ever come to you. Ask the old-timers Young, young people here ask, uh, tell me, is, is it going to be fulfilling to have more? Is it going to be fulfilling to, to satisfy all my appetites? Ask them, and they'll tell you. And the answer is a resounding no. The only thing satisfying is to drink 
from the fountain of living waters of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the good shepherd. And he's inviting you to be guided because if you're like me, oh, did I laugh? But then I wept thinking about, that's me. You know, getting pulled out by the good shepherd, right? Pulled out of that ditch. And, and then I run and I jump both feet, now quadruple feet here in this case, both feet back into the ditch. Repeat offenders. <laughs> now, the Lord Jesus provides shelter in place. He protects us from the sun and the heat. He guides us to living waters, not brackish waters. But then he leaves the, la the best for last in verse 17b. He just wipes off the tears. Wipes off the tear forever. So are we, are we resisting the guidance of the shepherd? And I, that's the question for the week. Ask among your family, amongst your friends. In what way are we blind? And so the end of the story, before we go to communion here, the end of the story with George Matheson. So his sister took him in for years and read the Bible to him and helped him prepare, learn, and transcribe his sermons. So he became known throughout Scotland, and even Queen Victoria heard him. Right? And then at age 40, on the eve of her sister's wedding which you can imagine was a painful reminder of his broken heart. He says that a song came to him. A song came to me, he says. I had the impression that it was being dictated to me. And it was the hymn that goes something like this. Some of you may know it. O oh, love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee, I trace the rainbow through the rain. Then he has his prayer. And I'm going to close this moment with this prayer. Listen carefully to the prayer. Restore my soul, O God. There are green pastures around me for which my eye has no lens. There are quiet waters beside me for which my ear has no cord. Restore my soul. The path on which I go is already the path of righteousness. Open my eyes. Open my eyes that I may behold its windows. The place I call dreadful is even now the house of the Lord. Maybe this week we should itemize all the avoidance strategies that we have. And yet, the great trib debates is that God does not spare you from pain and suffering, but he passes through it with you. He's right there with you. Back to the prayer. The heavens shall cease to hide you when you have restored my soul. May I be content to know that your goodness and mercy shall follow me without waiting to see them in advance of me. Lord, open our eyes to see the greatness of your salvation. Open our eyes to our foolish ways to jump right back into the ditch refusing the guidance of the good shepherd. Open our eyes, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. So as we prepare our hearts for communion, you know, old-time Presbyterians, they have communion once a quarter, but it's a big deal. There's a whole week of preparation. I know we're congregational here, so we do it monthly, but it is a time of preparation too, preparing our hearts to receive this sense of through the symbol of communion, the sense of forgiveness. Because there's another powerful image as we prepare ourselves for communion. It's a powerful image also out of Revelation 7. Because these people have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. 
by placing their faith in Jesus Christ. They've been washed, and then they're given robes, their priestly garments, the symbol of even some uh, Christian traditions today, the, the priest will have a white robe. I, I pick Aloha shirts today, but it's... <laughs> and it's a symbolic image of forgiveness of sin. And, you know, we come to the communion table really not unlike Joshua the high priest in Zechariah 3. Not unlike him. He is before the Lord, and he's before the Lord, clothed, verse 3 of Zechariah 3, clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. You've got the priestly garment in Christ. You've got the, that robe of righteousness. Communion is a reminder of this wonderful transaction. The robes of righteousness from the Lord Jesus Christ in exchange of our filthy garments. So we're going to have the deacons, they're going to serve communion for us, and we're going to do it. Let me remind myself. You can come on the outside and then come down the aisle. We need Tiberius with these flashing lights from the airport. <laughs> yeah, come. So we're going to have our two deacons, and I'm going to help them in that process. And the music team is coming back to lead us in worship as well. And I think one thing I'd like to do, too, is put the, the communion. Um, and I'd like all of us to read it together. Can you all see it? Let's read it in unison, that communion rite. We don't do this many times here at TCC, but in, in a gesture of participation in worship. Let's read it together. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, took after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore, goodness, and righteousness. So don't you be too scared by that last part. Uh, <laughs> but the body of Christ broken for you and me. The blood of Christ shed for you and me. Come and receive the elements. Take these hands and lift them high. For I have not the strength to praise you.
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Here, here. Yeah. yeah, put this one back and you can have this. The, the body of Christ shed, uh, broken for you and me. The blood of Christ shed for you and me. Let's pray.
Father, we thank you for the gifts of forgiveness, the gift of salvation. Salvation belongs to the Lord, and we receive this free gift. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, please rise for the benediction. Taken out of Revelation 7 as well. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.